lot better. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Been getting rained on all day. No wonder I can't see anything. Just using my highly technical sweater to clean my glasses. Good evening. Good evening. Good to be in the house more tonight. Amen. Uh, you know, I don't know any of you, uh, many of my Facebook friends, but it's been a very interesting week for Michael and I. We are, as of this morning, officially homeless. So uh, don't look in our car <laughs> parked outside. We, we're, our official address right now is the Quality Inn in Altoona. So uh, looking forward to being homeowners again on Friday in Altoona. So, um, so <laughs> anytime life goes to, you know, what in a handbasket, I always think of James chapter one. So this is kind of where I'm at. So I guess this is what I'm going to share tonight. So uh, count it all joy, right? <laughs> Count it all joy when it comes from the right, when it comes from the left, when it comes from the top, when it comes from the bottom, when it comes from the front, from the back. Count it all joy. Uh, faith under pressure. Um, consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. Well, the good news is we aren't deficient in any way before the trials come, and we aren't deficient in any way no matter what our reaction to the trials are once they do come and after they leave. That's true. And I can tell you that some of the colors might be a little funky <laughs> coming out of, of my mouth or my, my attitude this week, but I know. <laughs> oh, yeah, you watch it. <laughs> my husband's like, can I get an amen? <laughs> um, it doesn't matter because it's not about me. It's not about what's going on, but it is an opportunity. Whenever, whenever it just it piles up, life, life can do that, right? Life can pile on from all sides, but it's our opportunity to be a witness and to show what matters to us. Yeah. Amen. And the stuff is the stuff. You know, Craig, uh, my son was in a car accident right in front of our house. <laughs> he was stopped and managed to get rear-ended from someone going in reverse fast <laughs> enough to do $4,500 for the damage to his car. He was not moving. The kid had completely stopped right in front of him, went in reverse and was going fast enough to do $4,500 worth of damage to the car, but it's just a car. And his parents had full coverage and, you know, I mean, crazy, crazy. And, um, yeah, so carpet stains on my, uh, you know, putting tennis shoes on on my lunch break this week, doing some carpets and clean out a shed and, I mean, just running every which way, but, you know, God is good. Yeah. God is good, and he just says, let us know every step of the way. And it's so funny. I was thinking tonight, I was getting a little emotional. Michael and I had our very first date in Altoona, Iowa, and it never occurred to me that we've kind of now come completely full, full circle. Yeah. <laughs> and Ten years later, 11 years later, after some guy from Kansas in the Army wouldn't stop emailing me, <laughs> he must have kind of liked me, <laughs> and uh, we met. And had our first date in Applebee's in Altoona, Iowa, and um, now we're going to be living in Altoona, Iowa. So it just it just hit me that life is funny sometimes. Yeah, the route funny. we take to get there, we yeah, you sure can. And you know, and when we were looking for houses, when we decided we were moving and leaving Waukee, I said, well, you know, I really feel like we need to be in the eastern gate of the city. I don't know if that means Altoona. I don't know if that means wherever, but we, I knew we needed to be on the eastern edge. And it turns out it was Altoona because God knew right where we needed to be. Yeah. Sold the house in exact perfect timing. Only homeless for two days, so <laughs> 36 hours to be exact. Um, but, you know, God knows, and he worked it all out. Even though I wanted to stress, I wanted it my time. He had it all under control, and it's, it's worked out perfectly. Yeah. It's been a little, I mean, you know, bumps in the road, but that's life. And, you know, it's so funny. I was talking to one of my coworkers at a conference today. We were driving up to a conference, and he said, you are just always so optimistic. He goes, I don't know how, everybody tells me all the time, I don't know how you do everything that you do. And I'm like, I don't either. But I can tell you that the Lord is my strength. Yeah. And what what he intends for us to do, he will make a way for us to do it. When we are when we are walking and living and, and being who we are created to be, he always makes a way. Yeah. Doesn't matter how many hours of sleep you get at night, doesn't matter how much money you make, doesn't matter what your status is, if you're doing what he created you to do, yeah. It'll be okay. Right. Yeah. It doesn't matter. And I said, you know, it's funny. We we're talking. I said, it's not going to rain until we get inside today because it was raining. <laughs> so we have, you know, dressed up for conference, all these boxes of giveaway stuff. And I'm like, it's not going to rain. And no one goes, okay. You know, because he had rain with me before. <laughs> Everybody else in the office knows not to argue with me about weather. <laughs> They're like, did I tell you my tornado story? 
because I missed an exit, so I missed the tornado. Not because I was chatting and not paying attention in the car, right before we almost missed our exit. Um, but it, you know, God is always with us, no matter where we go, no matter what we do, and we have an opportunity to witness in the silliest of situations. So I just encourage you to uh, let your true colors shine. Can't hide anything from the Lord anyway. Right. And why bother trying? Why are we trying? I mean, I just feel like sometimes yeah. we're, we're told that we're supposed to be something that we're not. That there's this idea of what a Christian looks like. A Christian looks like you and it looks like me. It doesn't look like anybody. <laughs> and Christianity is Jesus Christ. It looks yeah. exactly like him. Yes. And he comes in all shapes and sizes right now. Right. And so, yeah, anyway. <laughs> uh, to, to follow in my pastor's very strict footsteps. Let your free flag fly, <laughs> right? <laughs> Just be very, <laughs> I mean, seriously. <laughs> Just being blunt, letting, letting it fly, Nathan. We are who we are, right? We are colorful, and we are crazy, and we are zany, and we are unique, and we should be able to laugh and enjoy ourselves. And you know, that's what I love, is that we love each other just as we are. We don't have to pretend with each other. So Amen. I'm very thankful for that tonight. In Jesus' Amen. name. Amen. 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 <laughs> so uh, anyone else have anything they want to share? Any prayer requests? Any testimonies?
you that you are lead us and guide us in every situation, Lord. We thank you that there are no accidents in your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege to pray for one another in our times of need. We thank you that you watch over us, you watch over all of our house, Lord. That you watch over all of the members of this body, those who are here tonight, those who are not, Lord. We just ask you to call in those who are hurting, call in those who are seeking, those who are looking, looking for you, Lord, looking for somewhere they can come to know you and to meet you. Call them in, Lord, draw them into this house, Lord, where they may be ministered to. Come and meet with us tonight, Lord, as we come seeking your presence, Lord. We come seeking to, to gather together, Lord, to worship you, to lift you up, and to be transformed in our minds by, by the hearing of your word tonight. Oh, we thank you for a safe place to come. We thank you for a pastor whose heart is pure and whose word is powerful, Lord. To you continue to give wisdom and revelation to your people? To you continue to lead us and guide us into the truth? the new revelation that you have been saving for such a time as this, Lord. We thank you for all those gathered tonight, Lord. You know the needs, Lord. You know the needs in each of our lives, and we thank you that it is finished. We can just simply come and rest in your finished work, that the only labor that's left for us is to labor into that rest that you have prepared that we might simply just rest and speak your word and watch as you transform it, as you make all things new. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for the testimonies of your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. And we thank you, Lord, that all of these needs are met. Jesus, meet with us tonight, Lord. You are welcome here. In Jesus' name. Just a reminder, if you brought a cell phone with you tonight, to turn it on. And Women of Influence, uh, April 22nd, please be in prayer. Uh, ladies, be encouraged. I know that as we're studying what we want to share, uh, the Lord is going to reveal more and more as we go. Amen. Amen. All right, let's speak the word together tonight. Will you not, not revive us again, again that your people, people may rejoice in you? Hallelujah. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law, therefore I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes and devour for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And Abraham's blessings are mine.
you're drawing the women from this city, Lord, that you're stirring up a hunger, Lord. We thank you that you're giving boldness to women to step forward and minister to other women, Lord. Heart to heart, Lord. Spirit to spirit, Lord. And we just believe right now that there will be pearls of great price revealed, that there will be precious treasures released and received by all of the women who participate. We thank you, Lord, for the revelation and for the wisdom and for the provision and for all of the blessings that are going to flow for everybody who participates, Lord. Whether those are ministering or whether those are coming to receive, Lord, let this be a time that changes the lives of everyone who comes and participates. Let it be transformational, Lord, that we would know you and be more like you, Lord, and understand who we are, who we were created to be, the purpose for every woman, Lord divine purpose, Lord, and direction, and that we would love each other in spirit and truth, Lord, as we gather together in your name, Jesus, that you would be lifted high, that you would be magnified, that you would be lifted up and exalted through this whole thing, Lord. This is an effort of fruit of the spirit that you have born in this house, Lord, that you have laid this on multiple people's hearts, Lord, and we are being faithful to the call, Lord. Have your way. Lead and guide all of the women involved, Lord. Draw the women who need to hear the words to be spoken. Draw the women who need healing, who have broken hearts, who have lost their way, Lord. Who need a physical healing, who need an emotional healing, who need hope, and who need life, and who need to know you and be encouraged in you, Lord. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for the transformation that will happen in these women's lives. Thank you for the revelation that will be eye-opening. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for trusting us with this conference. Thank you for trusting us with these women's hearts. It's your ministry, Lord, and it's for your glory. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right, Ron, you want to come take the offering tonight for us?
praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to encourage everybody tonight to just all of the prayer requests that we've heard. Let's just believe. Yes. Just believe that God, God moves on our hearts to pray because he already has something he wants to do. And we know what that is because it's all written right here. All he wants is for us to agree with that. And we've done that tonight. So now all there is left to do is just believe. Amen. Just It's settled. Amen. These needs are met. That God will show himself mighty Amen. and faithful to his word. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, right now. Thank you in advance. You, Although, in fact, it's not in advance. This was done 2,000 years ago. And we thank you for it today in Jesus' name. Give the Lord a hand. Praise thank God. You. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you, Suzanne. Appreciate your opening. Good word. Hallelujah. Thank everybody for your testimonies and prayer requests. Thank you, Mike and worship team. Great as always. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. I'd like to just continue to, in this, you know, the key to everything is right here. And uh, the enemy comes to steal the word. So whatever God gives you a word or even, you know, you, you're looking for a way to pray about a situation or circumstance, you can expect that the enemy is going to come and try to upset this whole thing. He's going to try to bring evidence sense evidence at least against whatever God's word says. So we have to be consistent. And uh, I've said all along, you don't have to memorize scripture. It's a good thing if you can because you may not always have your Bible with you. But you need to know what the word says. In other words, you need to know what that God is good, that God always has a positive answer for your situation. May not it may not be the one you're looking for. It may not work out exactly the way you want it to be. But it'll be the best thing. Yeah. In the end, it'll be the best thing. So uh, I just encourage you. I really think God is trying to get us into this into this season if you want to call it that, which is these last days where the word of God again takes preeminence, where it really does prevail in our lives. And you know the 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 few uh, confessions that we have here before service. Again, I'm just going to say, see, we need to be doing that every day. Mm -hmm. you, you need to be declaring these, this truth over your life and over your family, over your health, over your situations. Because what happens so many times is we hear, we hear different things where all of a sudden there's a crisis. Well, God can move in a crisis. You need a miracle, Amen. right? But we don't always need a miracle. Although it's all miraculous, what we need is to have our lives lined up with the word so that we're just living in the supernatural. Yes. So that we don't have to have, you know, uh, crisis management, if you want to call it that. But we actually walk in faith, that we're actually believing God. Now, I know the world has a way and the enemy has a way of blindsiding us a lot of times in situations that we're not expecting. But if, we are, if, we're, if we understand the word of God, our faith is growing all the time. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Regardless of where you're hearing it from, the best place to hear it from is your own mouth, to be quite honest with you. But, uh, so if you have the, the fundamental understanding of what the word says, then you have, it gives you confidence. Call it confidence, you can call it faith, but it's the same thing. It's, I believe what this word, just like the song was just sung. I believe, why? Because... I have confidence that God's going to do what God has said he'll do. I've got some history with him, but sometimes you're dealing with people who don't have any history with God. So they're depending on your confidence to encourage them. And if you've got a word that you can give them, not just a, you know, a, gee, I'm sorry about your situation. That's okay, too. I mean, we want to love them and have compassion, but they need something positive. And what we want to give them is what God said. Because regardless of what we say, if it isn't in agreement with what God has said, it's just a crapshoot. You don't know what's going to happen. God may intervene and do something just out of his own goodness and grace and mercy. But generally, God responds to his word. 
Amen. Amen. He, he, he reacts and responds when we come into an agreement with him. Praise Amen. the Lord. So that's what I want to talk to you about t- tonight. And uh, Sally and I are doing this more and more. We, we've done it over the years, but we've, we've really been more focused on it than we have. I mean, we've always confessed the word. We've always declared the word. We've always read the word and prayed the word. But, but we're more focused on it right now than we ever have been before because I, both, of, both of us realize there's something God's doing. And it all has to do with his word. Yes, and we need to really stay focused there because God wants to do some fantastic things in these last days. And if he's going to do it, he's going to need us. Because yes. he just won't do it on his own. It's not that he can't. He has just chosen us to be the means by which he's going to do it. So we need to know how God thinks about things, right. how he looks at situations and circumstances in order for us to give a legitimate reality to people who are looking for answers from God, right? Mm-hmm. So that's, that's our goal. That's the purpose, amen? It glorifies God, and it blesses us at the same time. It really helps us to connect with the oneness that we have with God, amen? So I want to read to you tonight from 1 Kings. Uh, there's a really weird thing happens here in first in, in first kings chapter 13 i want to read verses 1 through 10 you've all probably read this before but if not i think i've taught on it before but not necessarily in this particular way but it's a real strange kind of situation that takes place but it's it's something as we know these old testament stories and i've talked about it before and i'm just going to repeat myself so you don't forget they're real they're factual they're actual historic events But they're also pointing to a a greater reality, a a bigger truth that God's trying to reveal to us. Otherwise, it'd just be histrionics, and that's not what God's into. So we want to look at it that way. So here in 1 Kings chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. Behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord. So the Lord gave him a word and sent him, right? He's not just going on his own. God sent him. God gave him a word and said, go unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, lay hold on him. In other words, he didn't like what the guy's saying. So he puts his hand out to touch the altar, and he says, get him, boys, get the guy, the, the, this prophet, this, this man of God that's prophesying, right? And he put forth his hand, saying, lay hold on him. And when he did it, his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it in again. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. The king said unto the man of God, Come home with me, and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way, and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Now, Mike, if you just go on to verse 11. Uh, We're going to jump around a little bit after that, but verse 11 first. Now, there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king, them they told also to their father. Now, if you can go to verse 18. There's no contradictions in that. I'm just jumping here so we just to save a little bit of time. He said unto him, I am a prophet also, as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. This is a false prophet. 
Amen? He says he's a prophet, but he's a false prophet because he just told him something different, the opposite of what God had told him, and then it actually tells us he lied to him. Now, this prophet is talking to the other prophet. That's all that was in verse 17. The preceding ones was just that this guy went to the prophet and took that thing. So he said unto him, I'm a prophet also. All right, verse 20, Mike. Verses 20 through 26. We'll just go over the rest of the way through. And it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. Now he told him God, you know, an angel came to me and told me that forget about what God said. He's changed his mind. He can come home with me. So the guy believes him. Goes against what God had told him and believes the other guy. So he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee. Now, this is great. The same guy that lied to him and got him out of the will of God now is condemning him for it. Yep. All right? But camest back and hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread, drink no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. And it came to pass after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back, the, the original prophet. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him, and his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it. The lion also stood by the carcass. And behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way, and the lion standing by the carcass, and they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. When the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion, which hath torn him and slain him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake unto him. So the original prophet, the real prophet, who went to proclaim God's word and work God's power, God's revelation, up until he got fooled. Yep. Fooled into believing something other than what God had said. Right. Yep. Praise the Lord. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. See, there's destinies right here. Every one of us. And God is telling us, he's giving us words to fulfill that destiny. And the enemy doesn't know your destiny. He just wants to make sure you don't fulfill it. So he's going to come and tell you anything right. other than what God has told you. Exactly. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Right. Amen. Second uh, Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Uh, verses 13 through 15. This simplifies everything. If you know what God said, that's all you really need to know. Right. You just can continue to de declare that, stand on that, so it's, you don't have to have a whole lot of other insights. And they'll come. They come and they go, and that's good. There's nothing wrong with any of that. But if you know what God has said, that's all the power you really need. Amen. And if that weren't the case, the enemy wouldn't always be coming for the word. Right. He doesn't care about much of anything else because that everybody that's all, all open to interpretation. Right. This is settled. Whatever it says is what it is. Mm -hmm. Right? So for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself transformed himself into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now, I'm not talking about people here. We're talking about the enemy. Right. This is what the enemy does. He tries to manipulate right. to keep people from operating in the word of God. Because this is the one sure thing that works. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Jesus, the word of God, he, the scripture says he is the light of the world. Right. He's revelation to the world. And we are to be children of light. There's no way we can do that outside of the word of God. Right. Amen. No matter how else 
we operate. If we're not operating in the word of God, we have no guarantees. There's no, there's no assurance right. of how it will out, how, what the outcome will be. Amen? So look, look I want to show you a few things here. And uh, remember that we're talking about, in the Gospels, we're talking about still an old covenant. Right. We're still under the original Mosaic covenant, right? Mm -hmm. So look at, I want, to, I want you to look at a couple of things. Luke chapter 11, verses 37 through 40. Now, God gave Israel commandments. And under the Mosaic law, there were specific things they were to do and specific ways they were to do it. But we know historically and even rabbinically from the writings of the rabbis, they added stuff to this. Right. So it wasn't the word of God. It was the word of God and their twist on it. Uh -huh. right. So Jesus comes along and... And we say, well, Jesus totally fulfilled the law. But then, when you read these accounts, you see him breaking the law. Mm -hmm. Well, we're trying to figure out what in the world's going on here. Who's right and who's wrong? Well, there was a spirit. There was a spirit of the law. There was a purpose for the law. And it had gotten so twisted and so distorted that it had undermined itself. And that's what Jesus is trying to expose. He's not just trying to break the law. He's trying to expose the hypocrisy and the phoniness of those who are basically teaching the law. Uh -huh. So look at what he said. And as he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him, and he went in and sat down to meet. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And the Lord said unto him, Now ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. And then if you go on, it's just one woe after another to the Pharisees because of their hypocrisy, because of their phonies, because of the way they twisted the law. Amen? So Jesus didn't wash his hands, and he, he you know, this was, a, this was a, a religious thing that they did, but it wasn't, it wasn't demanded. It was, a, it was just a thing that they did and made it a law. Right. And the worst part about it was, because they made it a law, it just became something they had to do without ever really understanding what the purpose for it was in the first place. Right. To be sanctified, to be holy, to be, you know, acceptable. So Jesus, he doesn't do it. And immediately, they call him out for it. Right. And Jesus, had they not said anything, Sally and I had this conversation, I think it was last night or the night before, we were just talking about some of this stuff. And I said, you know, here's the thing. It looks like Jesus is just looking for an opportunity to beat these guys up. But the truth is, if they hadn't said anything, he wouldn't have said anything. Right. Right. It was because they tried to attack him for not keeping some phony thing that they were doing, not understanding what it was they were supposed to be doing in the first place, he wouldn't have said anything. Right. Mm -hmm. But when they tried to make him a lawbreaker, that's when he turns on them right. and exposes their hypocrisy and their, their phoniness and their misunderstanding of the law. Mm -hmm. Amen. So this was ritual washing is what it was. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a, a religious addition. It was embracing symbolism and missing the point of the symbolism. Right. Right. Which was basically what they did all the time because Jesus even said, hey, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life and they're pointing to me and you won't receive me. Right. Everything that you know about the word of God is telling you about me. So that tells me you didn't get anything about what you've been reading out of the Torah, all of this time, all of the, the books of the Bible that you have. You've missed it. Amen. Because you've made the symbols and the types more important than what the symbols and the types are trying to point to, Amen. which is Jesus, Amen. the Word of God. Yeah. So we have lots of things that we do. And I'm not going to get into all of it. I'll talk about it more Sunday. And there isn't anything wrong with it except that a lot of times, they, it gets in the way of Jesus. Yes. We start doing the things as a replacement for what Jesus wants to do and be. Yes. Amen? Okay, so look at the, now John chapter 2 and verses 7 through 11. I'm just going to give a few of them here just to show you what's going on, okay? Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots. This is the wedding, the first wedding feast. And if you go back and look at the Eidershine's uh, uh, rabbinical teachings and a, and a couple of other uh, Jewish uh, writers. And they say that the, the, 
that Mary, that Jesus' mother, was probably a hostess at this, at this wedding. And that's why they, she came to them, to Jesus, because it was embarrassment that they didn't have enough wine. And the man who's head over this thing is a rabbi. The, the, the head of the feast. Okay, so that, just to give you a little background here, but Jesus said, I'm fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. What were these water pots? They were for ritual washing. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were only used for this ritual washing, for sanctifying people that would come to the whole house and so on and so forth. So Jesus tells them, he says, go, go fill them up with water. Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. So he said, fill them with water and then draw from those pots and take it to the rabbi or this governor of the feast, the one that's in charge of this wedding ceremony. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. Now, get this. This guy is a Jew. If he's, even if he's not a rabbi, he's an Orthodox Jew. To use those things for anything other than ritual washing was a sacrilege. Now, he didn't know because Jesus said just draw out from it and take it to him. He didn't say dig a water pot over there and dump, it, dump the wine in, it, in his bowl. He said draw from it and take it to him. Because here's the deal. These things could not have any vinegar, any wine, any residue, anything associated with wine could not touch that. If it mingled with that water, everything was... You see what I'm saying? So he turns this thing that was a, uh, a ritual, a, a sanctified, in their mind, deal, and uses it for just the opposite. Amen. Now, believe me, if this guy was a rabbi, or even if he wasn't a rabbi, just an Orthodox Jew, and knew it, he would have freaked out, and he probably found out eventually. Yep. So when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not where it came from, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. So not only does he drink it and say, this is good stuff, he, Jesus brings him into this thing. He gets him involved in it, right? Yeah. And saith unto him, every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that what is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cain of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. Now this is, this is what's important. Manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Now you've got to know, these disciples are Jews. Yeah. So they see something's going on here that doesn't make sense in terms of what their traditions have been. Right. But it says that this manifested forth his glory. Now, here, here's the, the thing that really stands out. That word glory is doxa, D-O-X-A. And it means opinion. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, it was God's, it showed forth God's opinion. Amen. But it comes from the root word, which is dokeo, and it means subjective judgment. Mm -hmm. Jesus was d judging their disconnect from God. He was saying, look, you guys don't get it at all. And he was the, as I've already said, he was the epitome of this reality that they didn't know anything about the word of God, even though they had all of it. And, and, and you know, were so precise in the way they would translate and copy and everything else, and yet they didn't get it at all. They didn't understand it. Right. And he's trying to show them how far off they've gotten. He's a revelation of God. He is God in the flesh. He is the word of God manifest. So he's judging their ignorance of the word. All right, look. So it goes on. Then look at John chapter 5. There's a couple more here I just want to show you, just for the repetition of it. But John chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. And I, here's what I'm saying. If we don't stay connected with the word of God, we can look back at them and say, what a bunch of fools, and how could they be so stupid not to see Jesus? But the truth is, we can be just as deceived. We can get just as yeah. twisted. If that were not the case, there wouldn't be 50,000 denominations. Right. Everybody's got their own twist on this thing. We're supposed to go back and try to look at this thing as 
blank and flat as we possibly can and just say, thus saith the Lord and not put our spin on it. Just believe it and operate from that reality. Amen. God is glorified that way. And not only is God glorified, but we get results that way. Amen. Praise the Lord. So a certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. When Jesus saw him lie there and knew that he had been long, that long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed, and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. So here's a couple of things that happened. First of all, you're not supposed to do any work, so he's carrying his bed. That's a work. Second thing is Jesus healing, that, that was considered a work. Both of these are happening on the Sabbath. Uh -huh. Don't kid yourself that Jesus didn't know it was the Sabbath. Uh -huh. And that Jesus didn't know what their traditions were. Right. But their traditions misunderstood the purpose of God. Yeah. God always wants to show mercy. God always wants to show grace. God always wants to show favor. God always wants to heal. It's always in God's mind to heal. I don't care what day it is. I don't care what the environment, what the situation, what the circumstance. God is a healer. Yes. Amen. He has compassion. This guy's been this way a long time. Uh, Amen. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, it's the Sabbath day. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. <laughs> I mean, it's almost crazy when you think of it this way. Look at verse 17, Mike. But Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto, and I work. God doesn't stop working. He's always working. He's always healing. He's always delivering. He's always, and he said, because he is, I am. Because I'm only doing what I see my father do. Praise the Lord. So again, he's judging their hypocrisy and their misunderstanding and misinterpretation of the word of God. All right, one more. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. These are religious people. I mean, these are the, the, the spiritual giants of their day. That's what I'm saying. This is the truth. This is the thing we've got to go by. I'm not against moving in the spirit. We've got to. We have to. But if it, it needs to be lined up with this word. Or we can be just as deceived and just as in the left field as these people were. We could be at odds with God, at cross purposes with God without even knowing it. Uh -huh. So, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did the sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. Now, how many of you know that was a no-no as far as the Jews were concerned? First of all, spitting, any, you go back in the Old Testament, you see any discharge causes a person to be unclean. So not only did, was there a discharge, it was an oral discharge, he spits, but then he makes clay. People made clay in that day. That was a job. That was something you did to make pots and so on and so forth. So he spits in the dirt, rubs it in his hands, makes clay out of it, and then puts it in the guy's eyes. So he's just off the charts as far as these. And let me remind you, it's the Sabbath. So it's like a grand slam. You know, it's a hat trick. He's, he's just done it all in one thing, he has upset everything about them. He has judged all of their hypocrisy, all of their misunderstanding and misinterpretation of the Bible, yes. of the Word of God. Yep. Praise the Lord. So the point is, I, I, I won't go on any further with that, but it's just, it's just going to be repetitious, but there's just more and more of it. We can't afford to make the same mistake. No. No. Right. By trying to do things that seem like they're right without knowing what God is doing in that situation. Exactly. Amen. Trying to do it by our interpretation or our twist on it 
rather than just what the word says. Now that's the reason, that's the reason for praying the word. Yes. Not, there's not things wrong, there's nothing wrong with praying. Our fear, you know, you know what I'm saying, obviously there's something wrong with praying fear. But there's nothing wrong with saying, help me Lord, when you don't know what else to pray. I mean, sometimes it happens, you're just, you know, like, oh! But when we're praying for people, when we're praying for situations, yes. we need to pray the word of God. This isn't about trying to make them feel a little bit better about their situation. This is about getting them delivered from their situation. And the only way to do that is by the word of God. Our sympathy alone is not enough. Jesus had empathy. He had compassion. But his compassion caused him then to say what God said about the situation. To preach or to pray the word of God. And that's what we need to do. I promise you, I'm just saying, we will get results. Why? Because the word of God cannot come back void. Amen. The word of God is settled. It'll do what the word says. If we will do it, if we will speak the word in faith, it has to do what it has to do. Yes. God's just looking for somebody who will agree with his word. Who won't try to make it fit our agenda. But just simply, that's your need. Here's what God says. We're going to pray and we're going to agree that God is going to do this because God has already said he would. And in fact, he has already done it. Yes. It's just a question of us releasing it. It's already settled in heaven. Yes. We release it here by declaring it. Yes. Amen. I said Sunday, this thing, God didn't write this. God spoke this. And he yes. spoke it so that it would be written. Yes. So that it would be written so that we could then speak it. Praise the Lord. That's the reason it is the way it is. Yes. So, okay, Philippians chapter 4, uh, verses 6 through 9, Mike. I don't know about anybody else, but I want results. Amen. I want to see a move of God. I want to see God move in people's lives. I want to see people healed. I want to see people delivered. I want to see people saved. Yes. To do that, we need to be faithful to this. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Yes. Praise the Lord. When you've got issues, you shouldn't be thinking about the issue. You should be thinking about the word of God that will overcome that issue. Yes. If somebody's got a problem, you need to point them to the word of God, something that's above their situation, something that's above that has authority over whatever it is they're struggling with. Yes. Amen? So those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace will be with you. Yes. you Praise the Lord. All right. All thinking. I, told, I said this to Sally the other day. I mean, all thinking is just asking internal questions. Yeah. If you think about it. Uh. <laughs> I mean, that's just the way it is. Whatever you're thinking, all you're doing is really asking yourself stuff. I mean, think about it. You walk into a, a room. There's a banquet or something. You walk in. What do you do? Uh, these, what do these people like me? Am I going to fit in here? How is this going to work? You know, you know what I'm saying? You're, you're always internalizing everything and asking yourself questions. Am I comfortable? Am I uncomfortable? Why am I uncomfortable? Why don't I feel comfortable? You know what I'm saying? With, with, with whatever the environment is, with whatever the situation is. That's thinking. Here's a perfect example. Somebody does something that really ticks you off. And here's the common way of responding to that. The more I think about it, the madder I get. Yeah. Why? Because I keep asking myself, why did they do that? Why did they say that? Did I do something? I didn't do anything. Why would they treat me that way? Why, why are they so mean? Why are they so... See, the more you're thinking, the more you're making reasons for getting angrier and angrier and angrier. Why? Because you're asking yourself questions and answering the questions. Mm -hmm. 
Praise the Lord. God is saying, here's what God's saying. When you start asking questions, go here. Quit asking the question and go to the word of God that has the answer. Quit having this internal dialogue all the time and replace those thoughts, those angry thoughts, those bitterness, that doubt, that fear, that anxiety. I'll never have it. won't ever happen for me. Why won't it happen for me? Because I'm not a very good person or I, I did something bad or all kinds of stuff is going to come through your head. At some point, you have to replace those thoughts. Think on something that's above. Because you're going to think. You can't stop yourself from thinking. Right. Even when you sleep, you have dreams. Even if you don't know you're dreaming, you're still having dreams. Your mind is still working. Mm -hmm. So think on this. Okay? All right, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. What is the exceeding greatness of his uh, power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places? Far above all principality and power and might and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. All right, look at Ephesians 6 and 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against those things that Jesus just tells us he overcame, right? Mm -hmm. Principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Praise the Lord. So here's the thing about spiritual warfare in the New Covenant. It's real. And the vast majority of it takes place in you. Right. That's what he's saying. It isn't we're out here wrestling around with a bunch of demons. Those demons bring thoughts. That th The devil tries to come and get you off of the word. Yes. Amen. He's trying to establish a principality or a position of authority and power in you. And the only way you can do it is to get you off of the word. Yes. Because Jesus has already come. The word of God made flesh has already come all, all overcome all of that. But if you get distracted from that word, if you get taken away from that, or if that gets taken away from you, now you're vulnerable. That's why he tells us, here's your weapon. Here's your offensive weapon. And I would just say this. If you, if you know how to use the offensive weapon, you won't have to worry that much about the defensive weapons. Exactly. And the offensive weapon is the sword of the spirit. It is the word of God. Yeah. You could get the devil running, and you don't have to worry about your protection as long as you're on the offense. You know, they always say the old... Saying the best defense is a good offense. Exactly. If, the, if your enemy's running away, you don't really need to worry too much about digging holes to hide him. Right. You just, your only problem is can I keep up with him? Right. All right? So the sword of the spirit, the word of God. Think on these things. Uh -huh. All right, Judges chapter 21, verse 25. And I preached on this a lot way back in Texas here in the year 30-some years ago. I remember preaching a message on this. And... Uh, it just blew my mind when I f first saw it years ago. In those days, this is the last verse, the last chapter of the book of Judges. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Nobody in authority. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now that's religion today. Because we've taken the authority of the king, the word of God, and made it subservient to our particular purposes or whatever they are, now it's up to us to determine what's right. I mean, can, just think about this. How is it that you can have church whole denominations that are for abortion? Right. Now, we, you know, if somebody's had an abortion, look, we understand, we sympathize, we, 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 there's forgiveness, there's mercy, there's all of that. Right. But who, what Christian can, would want to perpetuate that? All right, I'm, I, you know, I'm not a political, I, I've got my political beliefs, but I'm not a political, I don't talk about that stuff in the pulpit. I, that's, we, we should all vote our conscience. But there are so many things in the world today. Yeah. And you look at the church and you go, how, what, what Bible are they reading? Yes. Right. How can they, how can they, how can they say that's okay and that's good and that's, you see what I'm saying? Yes. So there's no, King, the religious mind is not controlled by the word. 
It just does what it thinks seems right. right. And that changes with every culture. It changes with every uh, generation or so. I mean, how many of you know things are not the way they were when you were a kid growing up? Exactly. I mean, they're just not. I, I watch the Lone Ranger every once in a while in the afternoon just because hey, he was quoting Proverbs yesterday. Right. The Lone Ranger. Serious. They would, he would have been run out of town on a rail today for bringing up anything about the Bible. Mm -hmm. right. But that was common. When we were kids growing up, those, all of us in here are old enough to know this. Some of us a little more so than others. But I'm just saying, when we were growing up, even non-Christians had a higher moral standard Absolutely. than some Christians today. Absolutely. And everything about our our kind of our communities and that, especially I grew up in a small town, but they validated Christian values. Right. The school, the Pledge of Allegiance, the, you know, you know what I'm saying. Uh, the, the neighbors, the pe people just had, they had values, moral values. I'm not saying there wasn't still bad stuff going on and all that, but I'm just saying there was, there, even if you weren't a Christian, you've got good validation from watching The Lone Ranger. Right. Yeah. You know, Roy Rogers and Dale Evans and some of those old shows that were Christian shows without being Christian shows. Yes. Right. Now today you got to get to the Christian channel to find anything. Yes. And even some of that's a little frightening. Yes. But I'm just saying, that's how much things have changed. Yes. And we moved away from the word. <coughs> and the result is our opinions lead to sense knowledge. Mm -hmm. What feels right. What seems right. What is relative to the culture that we're in. Sure. So today, you turn on the TV and even the little kids programs and you go, my God, what is this? Right. It's like demonic. It is. And it's just for little tiny kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here's an extreme example, but when we were in, in the Pentecostal church, you shouldn't, you weren't supposed to have a TV because TVs were bad. Well, TVs aren't bad. It's just the junk that's on there. You don't have sense enough to filter out what you're watching. You're going to get a lot of bad stuff. Well, 40 years before that, radio mm -hmm. was the bad thing. Uh -huh. But after a generation or two, all of a sudden radio wasn't so bad, but the TV is the bad problem now. Right. Or movies, right? You see what I'm saying? It's just gradualism. It's the way the devil works, little by little by little by little. I'm not saying TV's bad. I'm just saying you got to have sense enough to not watch everything that's on it. Exactly. Praise the Lord. I mean, it's no different than the movies. There's all kinds of movies out there. You don't have to go pay 20 bucks or whatever it is now to go to a movie if it's just a bunch of filth. Right. Unless that's what you want to see, you know? So anyway, all right. Look at Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. Very next verse. End of Judges. Everybody's doing whatever's right in their own mind because there's no king. Very next verse is Ruth 1. Now it came to pass in days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. No bread. Yeah. Lack of the word. Because there's nobody in authority. There's no king. There's nobody to point him in the right direction. Everybody's just doing what seems right. And a certain man in Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Now, we know that story. I'm not going to go through all of that, but it was a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Everybody's dying. They're intermarrying with, these, with the Moabites. Remember, they were the, the result of an incestuous relationship with Lot and one of his daughters or his, his daughters. Right. It was horrible. They, had, uh, they, had, uh, they would kill people on the altar. They were, they were just you know human uh, infanticide. All kinds of bad stuff was going on there. That's where these people went. They, they came there. Praise, Praise the Lord. Because there was no bread. There was no word in Israel. So they end up in Moab. Praise the Lord. Now Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Yes. I am the word of God. The word made flesh, right? All right, Mike, if you can, drop down to verse 6. Let's see what's happened. Husband dies. Sons die. Now she's got two daughter-in-laws that are heathens. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what it was. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law 
that she might return to the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them bread. The word. Right? So she's going back because she's heard that the Lord has visited and given them a word. Mm -hmm. Oh, we know the story. There's Orpah and, and, and uh, Ruth, and Orpah finally stays, and Ruth comes with her, right? Yes, sir. Right, verse 19. So they too went and they, until they came to Bethlehem, the house of bread. And it's interesting that it's also the birthplace of the bread of life, yes. the word of God. Amen. Amen. So it came to pass that when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them and they said, is this Naomi and, and so on and so forth. The house of bread, the house of the word. Jesus is born there. See, here's, the, here's what I'm saying. The word delivers you. Yes. Not somebody. Anybody who can read the word, who has faith in that word and speak it, God will move through them just the way he did through Jesus. Amen. There's no big eyes and little U's. There's none of that stuff. It's just if thou canst believe. If you know what God says about it and you were willing to speak it in faith yes. and believe it, yes. God will move. That's what we need. We need a move of God. Yes. Amen. This world needs a move of God. I mean, seriously, it needs a move of God. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. So, Ruth chapter 4 and verse 10. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife. This is Boaz speaking, the kinsman redeemer, the type of Christ. To raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of this place. Ye are witnesses this day. So the kinsman redeemer steps in. He says, I'll take her. I'll take this, this, uh, this uh, uh, lunatic uh, woman from Moab, this crazy pagan. Right? Yep. I'll take her. Yep. Yeah, thank the Lord. Yep. He took us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's a, that, that's a message the world could use. That's a message most of the people that come to us with all their problems could, could use. Yes. All right, verses 13 through 22. So Boaz took Ruth. She was his wife. When he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the woman said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath now not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath bore him. And Naomi took the child, and laid it in her bosom, and became nurse unto it. And the woman, the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, there is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, and the father of David. Amen. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez begot Hezron, so on and so forth. Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Amminadab. Amminadab begot Nashon. Nashon begot Solomon. Solomon begot Boaz. Boaz begot Obed. Obed begot Jesse. Jesse begot David. David was given a promise yeah. that your offspring will sit on the throne of Israel forever. And that would be our Messiah, yes. our Jesus, our Savior. Amen. The Word made flesh. Yes. Amen. So here's what I've been thinking. It's funny Suzanne talked about, I mean, how, who would have guessed 11 years you'd be back there buying a house where you had a first right? Yeah. right most of us if we went back 40 years 50 years whatever would not dream our lives would be what they are today right for whatever reason you're not, you're, your life may not have been a horrible mess just things happen right. and God works through it and here we are today 
thinking it was all chaos. There was no plan. We just stumbled through it, and here we are. Amen. Believe me, God knew exactly where you'd be at this time, this day, this year. He knows everything. He knows everything about you. So I don't want my life to be explainable without God. Because I've thought about it. I've thought it doesn't make any sense without God. And I don't want it to. Without his word, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Amen. In fact, I've thought over the years, there were times when I thought the sole purpose in my life was to simply serve as a warning to everybody else. <laughs> Praise the Lord. If I feel that way, maybe I'm the only one been down that road, but... We need to live in a way where we believe the word of God so much that if he doesn't come through, we're screwed. Now, a lot of times we have to do that, right? I mean, we get in positions where we just don't have any choice. But we ought to live our lives that way every day. Not just when we get backed into a corner. I want the word of God to do things that I know are not of me. They can't be faked. They can't be forged. They can't be accounted for by human reason. If it ever happens, and it probably has happened to all of you, something supernatural, something miraculous, you, don't, you, you wouldn't trade that for all of the other good things that you've been able to do. Because that has value. That has a value that you cannot put a price on. It's God connected with me. God showed himself to me. God, I experienced his love. I experienced his you know, his, his, his compassion, his, his desire to be one with me. That's what's important. <coughs> All right, look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. <coughs> oh, excuse me. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above not on things on the earth, because you're dead. And your life is hid with Christ mm -hmm. in God. Mm -hmm. So I, don't, I really don't believe that God wants any of us to live in a way that makes sense from the world's perspective. Yep. Praise the Lord. Amen. I, I believe we're being called to live in a way that cannot be mimicked, that can't be faked, that cannot be manufactured. That's the hunger for the spirit. Because something in us knows that there's something more to us. And so we reach for things and we do some things when sometimes it would be better just to say some things. Am I making sense? We would just speak the word with authority. I'm telling you, we'd see some supernatural. Mm -hmm. We'd see some moves of God that would freak us out. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Amen. This is talking about living by the word. You just cannot let anybody tell you anything that doesn't agree with the word of God. Once you know what it, what, it, what it says, then that should be what you say. That was the problem with the prophet. He was mightily used of God. Mm -hmm. But he let something creep in and tell him something other than what God said. Exactly. Yep. Look at the power of the guy. I mean, he just, he declared what God said. And the first thing that tried to come against him was shriveled up. This was a king he was dealing with. Yeah. And the one that had atta attacked him then begs him. To pray for him. Right. Right. Praise the Lord. So, you know, we see all these scriptures, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to read any more scriptures so we can finish, but being one with God. Jesus talks about us in John 17, 21. He's in the Father. We're in him. He's in the Father. We're all become one, right? Yeah. So here's, here's my take. God wants to do more than come alongside and help us out. I'm saying God wants us to become what we are. Yes. And the only way we can do that is by the word of God. 
the same power. I mean, I know we all know this, but just when you think about it, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in each one of you. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, that's power. There's no other power like it. Atomic power is nothing like this. Atomic power can destroy, but it can't give life. It can't make life. It can't create life. It can't bring life back from the dead. This is God power. This is, this is something that only God can do. And he's in us. And he, he's given us the blueprint, the means by which we can do the same thing. You can do all things. By the power of his word. So let's, let's raise the freaky flag, you know, but, but let's do it in a way that is in total agreement with the Lord. If we're going to be weird, let's be weird for Jesus. You know what I'm saying? If we're going to, if we're going to look different, let's look different because we're standing on the word of God, Amen. not because we're just doing different stuff, but because we're speaking in opposition to the lies of the enemy. We become children of light. We bring the light into the darkness. God is revealed. People get the true image of God, the true picture of God, the true reality of God. The only way that can happen is if we give them the true word of God. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. When you're confronted with anything, I don't care what it is, go to the word. Amen. Declare the word. Speak the word. You may, it may not happen overnight. It may not be just a wave of the hand and all of a sudden it's done. But I'm telling you, this word will come back. It will come back and perform what it was sent to do. If it can find somebody that believes it, that will speak it, it will do. He said, whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. Amen. Well, this word's already settled in heaven, so I don't even have to worry about it. All I got to do is say it, and I know that it's going to bind whatever it is I'm dealing with right down here on earth. You just got to have the courage to do it. Amen. 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 Give the Lord a hand. Praise God. <laughs> amen. Amen. God bless all of you. Appreciate your patience. Speak the word in faith.